Good morning, everyone. Um, we are recording this webinar and we are starting. Um, we'll take a minute with some introductions and information uh, while people are getting logged in. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Janda and I am actually at the Embarrow House this morning. Um, and I'm here with, I'm not here, I'm with Hal Ming on the screen who is at his house. And Hal will be doing the presentation this morning. Um, and I have a reminder coming up here on my screen telling me that I have to do this this morning. <laughs> um, yeah. um, <clears throat> so we are going to be talking today about pickling cucumbers and other vegetables. And this is a really great webinar. It keeps evolving over time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to let Hal introduce himself in a minute here, and then we'll get started. Um, I suspect that most everybody has done Zoom by now. But if you haven't, there is a menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have questions, I would strongly urge you to put them in the chat rather than the Q&A, because then everybody can see them, um, see the question, they can see the answer. Uh, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can record, you can copy that <clears throat> at the end and um, save it. And I need to clear my throat here in a minute. but. Um, so if you can use the chat and then there's a drop down, if you open the chat, there's a drop down, um, a little drop down carrot, I think it's called, upside down carrot. If you open that, you can change that to everyone instead of to the um, presenters and the um, host. And then that way you, everybody can see your questions. And I will put a welcome in there. I will be using the chat to put information in, um, resources for Hal and on the, the list here. And then we will be um, <clears throat> emailing the reference, <coughs> excuse me, the resources to um, everyone who um, has attended today. So Hal, let, I'll let you take over and I'll turn my volume off here. Okay, just a quick question before you turn your, uh, <laughs> before you go away for a second. Um, how did we, or when did we want to deal with a couple of questions and having people respond to the chat after I do introduce myself or? Um, if they have questions, if they want to put them in the chat, um, I can pop up on the screen if they uh, need to be redressed right then. And you can, when I'm up there, you can see me and answer them or we can hold them until the end if they're more complicated. Okay, well, I guess I was referring to the question. I have a couple of them. I'd like to know how many folks have done any kind of uh, food preservation and how many are community <laughs> gardeners or have their own garden at home. Okay, so, so I'll put that question in the chat. Uh, how many have done preservation before? Yeah, of any kind. And, and whether they have a home garden or community garden. So as she was saying earlier, uh, this constantly is evolving. So we're taking care of those last minute details right now. Okay, so folks, if you um, do have, um, you can put that answer in the chat if you have done a preservation before, if you have a home garden or you're part of a community garden. Um, and if you check that to everyone, you can, we can all see it. So Hal, can you see the chat? Uh, I'm about to open it, yeah. <clears throat> okay, good. Okay, we just have one answer coming in. We have a few people still joining us. So Hal, why don't you tell about yourself and, and CFPA, and then by then maybe we will have enough in to get started. All right. Well, as been pointed out, I'm Hal Ming, and I'm the founder, executive director, and lead instructor with the Center for Food Preservation Arts. And you can see from our logo there that we have four main spokes of what we want to do with the programs. We want to make sure we provide access for people 
uh, no matter what their mobility level is, their income, uh, their situation and experience. Uh, we want to provide things that are educational, support other programs like food banks and feeding ministries, and also develop community because that's how I got into this. Um, I have lived through in my life what could be termed four major disasters, and I became very interested in supporting uh, communities in getting, you know, getting back from those kind of events. And so I did volunteer work with FEMA and CERT and other things. I'm a member of ARIES, and I found that communities that had activities where they did things together, whether it was like quilting or canning food or community gardens, would recover much sooner because they already knew each other and had some access to the resources that people would share. And so that's why I became involved not only with community gardening, but also with canning and, and production of things that people could share. And so this is kind of like our, our motto, our catchphrase, growing together through the community of food. And so you can see here is one of our activities where we build communities. We're working with the Trinity Lutheran Church's feeding ministry to make applesauce and can it. We have permits through the Department, uh, Washington State Department of Agriculture, which allows us to distribute those products, jams and applesauce to the public. Uh, we work, as you can see, with all ages. Um, I'm never sure if you see my cursor, but I'll, I'll try not to flail it around like I often do. And then we also have found ways to work during the whole pandemic things. And in a way, the silver lining for me on that is it really prompted me to learn more about online presentations like Zoom and Skype and to be able to do things uh, online all through the pandemic. And we intend to do a lot more of those. And I'm thankful for the Enviro House for helping uh, support us in various ways to be able to learn how to do that. And so I always like to start with a little bit of context and hopefully sometimes some of the facts are amusing. So these are some of the great points of pickles in history. Now, we just passed it, but July was National Pickle Month. And I don't understand why but November 14th is pickle day. I guess that's because by November 14th, any kind of uh, shelf stable pickles will have uh, set up where they've had their time to absorb the flavors of the spices and uh, they will be hopefully still crisp. That is you know, pickles, most shelf uh, stable pickles will last well over a year and remain crisp but that would certainly from July to November would certainly be uh, a safe amount of time. Uh, first uh, mentioned in records was over 4,050 years ago. And I don't know the exact source of that, but you can imagine it wasn't in the regular um, English. So if some kind of records were found, uh, maybe there was a hieroglyph of someone getting a pickle out of a barrel, who knows? And besides dehydration, and then of course freezing in the colder climates, pickling was the best way to preserve foods. Every culture has some form of pickle. It's very uh, something similar to kimchi or sauerkraut or regular pickles. Um, there are just thousands of unique flavors and different products that are made by that process. And we'll go through in a moment uh, all of what it is that actually defines what a pickle is. And they can be used in recipes, all kinds of recipes. I like to pickle things like carrots and asparagus and open a jar. And when I'm making like an egg salad or a tuna salad uh, 
or some other, uh, like yesterday, I added some to uh, a, um, I guess it was a cold salad of uh, pasta and tuna and some uh, yogurt dressing. And it's just really, there's a lot of use for pickles besides just eating them outside of a recipe. And we have provided a resource list that has even more history and types of pickles and many different things like that. If you're like me and like to dig really deep into some of these topics or just uh, cruise some of them for amusement now and then. It's like I've given you your own rabbit hole you can jump down. So what are pickles? Pickles are fresh fruit or vegetables in an acidic liquid. So pH is the way that they measure acidity. And the lower the number, the more acidic it is. And anything under 4.7 is considered an acidic environment. And that helps to retard the growth of bacteria because bacteria don't like it to be really acidic. And that makes it hard for them to reproduce and also for them to grow. So it makes them far less likely to spoil. Plus that acidity helps to stop some of the natural processes that are separate from bacteria, but where the enzymes start to deteriorate the vegetable or fruit. And this acidic environment can either be created by fermentation or by adding vinegar. And water bath canning is a way to make the, the product that you come up in the acidic environment shelf stable. Uh, they pretty much, anything that can be pickled through a uh, certified recipe, a recipe that you get from a source where you know it's been tested and proven safe, uh, don't need to be pressure canned uh, like you would if it was just, oh, uh, say green beans in water where there is no acid added. And so here's a picture that I love. It's Mexico City. It's back when we had the first uh, scare in the world of the avian bird flu. And I happened to be down in, in Mexico City at that time. And this was a local store down there that within Oh, it was less than an hour after that announcement, uh, they, uh, the store shelves going empty. And I don't need to tell you the same thing can happen in the United States. We've seen that in our, the whole recent pandemic. Um, I, I don't want to be boastful or too smug, but because of my work with recovery from disasters, I always try to keep a minimum supply of things in my pantry, but also um, because I remember what it was like, uh, even though nothing happened, but the whole Y2K panic was the first time we had a run on toilet paper. Um, I do have the space in my attic and I store 52 rolls <laughs> and it doesn't really take that much space. It's like two packs from Costco. Uh, but I know that I'm set for at least a year because I'm here by myself. So that works well for me. Another uh, reason to make your own pickles is because you can control the ingredients. It shocks me. I have not recently updated uh, some of these figures, so they might be a little out of date. But 152 pounds of sugar a year are contained in the products that most Americans eat. And it's hidden in a lot of different ways. Um, one of my favorite things, phrases, when people talk about that, uh, about the presence of sugar or corn syrup, as they call it, uh, crouching tiger, hidden carbs, when you go to get some ethnic foods. Because for some reason, both uh, Chinese and uh, Mexican restaurants tend to put sugar in because they think that's what Americans want a lot of. And so, you know, you can go out and eat and you think you're getting away from high sugar, but you need to be really careful. And the amount of salt is ubiquitous. 
almost 2,000 pounds of salt per year is contained in our foods. And that's way more than what we need. And then there's the cost. The last time I went out and compared the prices of pickled green beans, a uh, variety of dilly beans, spicy ones in particular, a single char of a major brand name was $7.21. And then you can see on the other side of the screen, including the jars and the lids and the rings and all the ingredients, for $6 total, you could make six jars of exactly the same product. Plus already you're controlling the ingredients in it. And then just in general, I think this quote from uh, the movie, Just Eat It, which I believe still is available on uh, Netflix. Certainly it is on Amazon if you wanna rent that and take a look at it. But this quote sums up one of the main things that I worry about is that we trash so much food because no one eats it. And a lot of that is because fresh food, we buy too much or we grow too much or we have too much and we don't preserve it. And preservation can be done in small batches. There's lots of resources uh, for small batch canning, especially in pickling. You can make just two or three jars of pickled dilly beans. Or, or other kinds of relishes from by making mixed vegetable relishes. And it's really not that hard. So I'd encourage people to think about that, especially in pickle, because the uh, increased acidity is one way of preserving that's quite safe once you get the hang of it. And it's fast. Right, before we get into examples of different kinds of pickles, um, did we want to address any questions that appeared in the chat? We have not had any yet, although I did put um, a note in that people are encouraged to ask questions and to put them in there. Great, thank you very much. Yes, and at the end of the presentation, if you have questions that are not related to pickling, uh, I'd be happy to uh, take some of those questions. And so these are just uh, for informational uh, sake, a uh, kind of definition of different kinds of pickles you may hear about, uh, things that I didn't know. Um, like dill pickles, obviously it uses dill and it's one of the most traditional pickles. But in some parts of the country or ethnicities, you can have like, um, instead of dill, there are recipes that use basil and others, other spices, curry type spices, things like that. As long as you're using a recipe that has been tested by an organization uh, that is certified like the National Center for Home Food Preservation or Ball corporation, things like that. Uh, the way that you can spice the pickles is almost endless. And then this, my mother always made bread and butter pickles, which are quite sweet. Um, they put a lot of sweeteners in them. Uh, but I hadn't realized that in the Great Depression, they became named bread and butter pickles because sometimes all people had to make a sandwich out of was some bread, butter if they were lucky, and then the pickles from their pantry. Gherkin pickles are basically baby cucumbers that have been pickled. And kosher, true kosher pickles are always by tradition fermented. Sauerkraut is a pickled product and it's fermented. And then many other vegetables like making kimchi and fermented uh, beet kraut and things like that that we have uh, resource links to if you want to dig deeper into that. And then just because uh, people often ask me what the difference is, a relish is a pickle that are finely cut fruits or vegetables that are not cooked, but then pickled. Chutneys are larger pieces of fruit or vegetables, and chutney is almost always cooked and then canned. 
And then we have the actual different methods of making pickles. A uh, refrigerator pickle is just what it says. It's a pickle that you basically put in the acidic solution and they're not water bath canned or processed in any other way. So they're not shelf stable, but they will keep in the refrigerator for up to a month. And if you leave them for a few days for the flavor to soak in, uh, they are some of the crispest pickles that you can have um, because they don't get overheated at all. And then fresh pack or otherwise called quick process can be water bath canned. And those basically are just heating the vegetable that you're pickling or fruit in a brine solution. And brine has a lot of different uh, meanings. But this brine is one that is not necessarily really salty, but it you'll almost always has some salt in it for taste and stability. But then it also has a 5% vinegar. We'll get into more of that a little bit later. And then it's pretty much always water bath can, which makes it a fresh pack. Short brine technique is you have a somewhat stronger solution with salt in it. And the vegetables or fruits are soaked in it ahead of time and then rinsed and the rest of the process done. And we'll go into some detail on that. And then fermented or long brine are heavily salted. And that is uh, something else we'll discuss fermentation in some detail, touching on a little bit about what you need to do to make sauerkraut. So I want to get into a little bit more about refrigerator pickles. It is a good way to start. It's a good way to uh, investigate small batch canning. So for example, this is a bunch of uh, cauliflower that I had left over. And so I just pickled the cauliflower. Uh, then there's uh, other vegetables that were available from my garden or that I'd gotten fresh. And so I made some jars that had green beans in them and carrots. And of course, all of these, we can't see it, but they have garlic in them. And they were all done at the same time. It uses up the odds and ends. And like I just pointed out, it's flexible ingredients. And you can also alter the amount of vinegar in them because they are not expected to be shelf stable. But you do want to follow a tested recipe. So the acidity in refrigerator pickles can be altered a little bit, but always use a safe recipe. And then, of course, refrigeration keeps it safe. The cons, the downside, is they're not shelf stable. They store really the maximum in the refrigerator to have them maintain taste and texture and everything is only up to two months. And you never want to let them sit out for longer than two hours. That's like the rule for safety for everything, whether it's in an acidic environment or not and you need electricity to safely store. So if you had extended periods of time where the power was out, you might um, run into some problems there. And here we have an example. Uh, I have some videos which are in our resource list, which we did uh, with Point Defiance Ruston Senior Center. And one of those is actually going through the process of making uh, the refrigerator pickles. And so this isn't the complete recipe, but it just gives you a taste, <laughs> no pun intended, that you can go and uh, take a look at. Uh, so at this point, do we wanna see if there are any questions or anything in the chat that we need uh, to take no care of? No questions again, but I'm putting the uh, links as you're talking about things, I'm putting those links in the chat for people to copy at the end. All right. And then the fresh pack or quick pack. And this because they're expecting it to be a shelf stable product, you really, really use the tested recipe. 
I know I keep coming back to that, but all the time I have people who say, well, my friend does it X way and then explain what they do. And I realized because of the training I have as a uh, master food preserver, that that's a pretty dangerous way they're doing things. And the other one I get is, well, my grandmother's recipe never did it this way. Well, sometimes grandma's family was just lucky. But also, uh, there are some things that have changed with our vegetables, um, not because of genetic engineering, but because of breeding and because the way that they are shipped to market uh, often when they're not fully ripe so that they will stay and also the exposure to different chemicals they use to force ripening uh, may have changed the way that they interact when they're canned and preserved. So you want to go to a site like the I've mentioned National Center for Home Food Preservation or the Ball Cookbook or the uh, University of Georgia Extension Service. They're um, perfect preserving courses and their textbooks are just excellent. A lot of all that is in the resource lists that we'll be providing. And it goes the extra step of water bath canning. So if you're not familiar with water bath canning, we also have some links to uh, tutorials on that. You can also uh, go in to different sites and find some pretty good videos on them, but always be careful when you're looking at resources online on your own that they don't try to hide the source of their information or they neglect to mention it. All the good videos uh, on, on YouTube and all the good articles, somewhere in there, they will mention and list the resources, like where they got the recipe from. And often they will other recommend other um, resources like I'm just doing, telling you to go and find some good information on water bath canning if you've never done it. Um, now, what we call vinegar brine is the base of the fresh pack. And that's a solution that is lower in salt than the fermenting brine. And you always want to use pickling salt when you're making pickles, or it can be called kosher salt or canning salt. The thing of that is, is it doesn't have added iodine, which can often cause some vegetables to uh, change color in a way you don't want. And they often have caking agents which will cause the, as the pickles sit, for it to become kind of murky. And you don't know if it's 100% safe or not. Uh, just hearkening back to one of my first experiences with how important it is to use salts that don't have iodine in them for this. Um, this was back when the Master Gardeners program uh, still had a food, uh, a recipe, a canning hotline that you could call. And I think pretty much most places have stopped doing that. Uh, but I made some onion and I also made some uh, garlic pick, pickled jams. They were jams, but they did contain vinegars. And the, especially the garlic one turned the brightest green I'd ever seen. And so I called uh, the hotline and they just laughed at me and they said, you know, what kind of salt did you use? And did you use a container that um, like stainless steel or something with that? And I had done both of those things. And it was the interaction between the iodine and the vinegar and the stainless steel. Um, you always want to use a ratio of no less than 50% vinegar to water. So when you're looking at a recipe, make sure that it's 50-50 or a higher vinegar ratio. There are a few recipes that are almost, especially in the refrigerator ones, 100% uh, vinegar, uh, but that sometimes is a little bit strong. And you always want to be sure and use a vinegar that is 5%. As you can see here, a little label down here, 
So it's diluted to water just to 5% of the acid strength. You can go and buy vinegars, and I didn't even know this existed until I started canning, but they're called like salad vinegars, and they can be as low as 1% to 2% vinegar. And then the spices, as I mentioned, can be mixed and very different between recipes. And they're usually good to store up to two years on the shelf. Uh, but of course, once they're open, they definitely need to be refrigerated. And they require no electricity for preservation. And these are just examples of some fresh pack. Once again, it's like this mixed vegetable, much like the refrigerator. But uh, one small difference is a large bay leaf off my uh, culinary bay tree. Uh, this is asparagus, spicy asparagus, uh, traditional uh, dill pickle slices. You can see the dill there. And these are radish pickles, which um, I wasn't as impressed with them as I thought I'd be. But they stayed very crispy and were useful on a like a relish tray. And then just a longer, you know, the spear, the spear versions of dill pickles. And here are a few tips for making cucumber pickles and keeping them crisp. You want to use the right pickle. Uh, there are what are called pickling varieties. And in the photo down here, you can't quite see it, but a pickling variety has those little nubs on it. Whereas slicing cucumbers or English cucumbers are pretty much a smooth skinning skin. And the difference is that the slicing or English cucumbers have a lot more water in them and a lot less strength. So they'll become more mushy if you try to pickle them. If you're growing them or you have access to them, pick them young and pick them often and preferably in the early morning. And if there is a delay in processing, the ideal would be to store them in ice water. At the very least, put them in water in your refrigerator if you can. And you want to trim off a 16th of an inch on the blossom end. And you do that because the blossom end contains an enzyme. And when it gets in a vinegar solution, that enzyme comes out and starts uh, the, the enzyme process, which makes things kind of mushy. And you want to avoid over-processing. A lot of people uh, process the uh, water bath them in quarts, but for the most uh, crisp and fresh pickles, you want to do them in pints because if you're following water bath recipes, there's almost always a different time between pints and quarts, and quarts take a lot longer, and there's a chance that it'll, that just that amount of time will uh, help to cook the pickle slightly. Uh, we've already mentioned use only canning salt. Look for low pack res or raw pack recipes. Those are ones where you don't boil the fruit or vegetable in the liquid. And so especially for cucumbers or pickling zucchini, you want to look for ones that are raw pack where you clean them, chop them to the size, cut them to the size you want, pack them in the jar, and then adding the brine on top of that, and then water bathing. And it often helps to have a tannin-containing agent. And so that can be, I keep a small grapevine, which is out of control right now, uh, primarily just to get fresh grape leaves, because grape leaves contain tannin, and that helps to preserve the pickles, or the cucumber's freshness. Uh, Another uh, agent that contains tannin is black tea, which imparts a bit of a flavor, but there are some recipes for that. Uh, and I kind of like it myself. And a lot of the older recipes have alum or lime in them. And those chemicals, while they will help to promote crispness, are a little bit dangerous. You have to do a lot more steps and really pay a lot of attention to it. So um, 
pretty much you can skip the alum or lime. And then there is also a process from the National Center for Home Food Preservation, uh, which I put the, the link down there. It's also in our resources uh, for what's called low temperature pasteurization. And so pretty much all water bathing, you set the amount of time they're in the water bath uh, for various reasons, heating it all the way through, but also expelling the air. So the jar forms a vacuum is set to a specific time. And uh, this low temperature pasteurization is tested and safe, but you run it at a much lower temperature. Most water bath canning, you want to bring it to a full boiling point of like a 212 at sea level or it's different for different altitudes. For the low temperature pasteurization, you run it at 185 to 190 for a much longer time. So instead of like 10 minutes at the rolling boil, it'll be like 30 minutes or more at the lower temperature. And you need to monitor the temperature all the way through. So that's a lot more work. And it's something that if you've never water bath can before, you probably want to experiment. Uh, not Don't let that be your first uh, experiment. Uh, do we, any, any questions yet or anything you'd like to add uh, before I go into the next technique? I need a um, over here. No, no questions yet. I'm keeping up with the resources in the chat, which people can copy when we're through. Great. Uh, as you can tell, I don't have the chat open because I become easily distracted by having too many windows open. So the short brine technique, where it is a stronger salt solution than a pickling brine. Uh, and in, in the short brine, there's no vinegar added yet. And it's often used for mixed vegetable relishes. And it's chopped vegetables, sometimes fruit that are mixed with canning salt or use a salt solution. And you let it sit for two to 12 hours as the recipe specifies in the fridge or on ice. And what this does is it draws out a lot of the natural juices and water and allows them and allows the space to be created for when you have drained those vegetables, rinsed them, briefly, and then you cover them with the brine and spices, there's room for all that good flavor to be soaked in. Uh, but it's short time compared to how long it would take for fermentation. And the brine, the salt isn't uh, high enough so that you aren't really starting to ferment it. So you're still going to need the acid in a canning brine, a pickling brine that you put on after they're rinsed. And just here are some examples of that, some relishes, a uh, carrot and radish shredded. Chow chow is one of the traditional ones that has a lot of red pepper, green tomatoes, um, different things. It's almost a version, except they often have a lot of um, sugar in them. And then the end of the garden is pretty much what it says. It's pretty much everything that you can need to do in either a small or large batch to use up produce that's available at the end of the garden season. And then piccalele is one that often contains uh, turmeric or dried mustards or things that give it that yellow color. And this one appears to be a version that is not water bath cannibal, but the not a cannibal, but you can't can it, uh, that has been made for a refrigerator version of that. So now let's get into fermenting, making the sauerkrauts and the kimchi and the others. And that's always also known as long brine or fermenting brine. It starts with vegetables or fruits, pickling salt and water. And each recipe specifies the amount of salt you need to use because a higher acidity will inhabit the bad bacteria, doesn't allow them to grow. 
And so it's depending on the vegetable's natural acidity, it's going to be 2% up to 5%. And there are measurements for that in the recipes, how much salt per water, et cetera. Uh, some things, uh, well, we'll talk more about sauerkraut in a minute. But what it does is it allows the lactic acid bacteria to grow. And they're the form of fermentation that we're looking for. We're looking for that lactic acid fermentation, as opposed to alcohol fermentation, which is a different kind of bacteria. And you place them in a container that's been sterilized, and it may take up to one to six weeks for it to reach the acidity and the texture you're looking for. So digging into the process, and we're gonna use uh, sauerkraut as just an example of one form of fermentation. Uh, but no matter what, in fermentation, you're going to need some kind of a container. And so the traditional one is these crockeries. But then there are also these modifications, which are really great if you're making something like um, kosher pickles. And these are what are called water seal. Um, what it has is it has the weights, which we'll talk a bit about. But up at top here, it has this rim. And then it has a fairly tight fitting lid here. And what you're doing, and we'll talk about airlocks in a minute, is once you get everything in there and it starts fermenting, you want to keep additional uh, bacteria from floating in. And you do that by keeping everything under the brine and keeping outside air out. And so if you put water into this area here, it makes the lid seal on tight. Uh, so this was a gift from a good friend, and it really is a great, um, it really is a great thing to use, uh, especially if you don't, if you have one already, and you don't want to spend time monitoring a lot. Other containers can just be a regular uh, large or a pint or a quart mason jar. Um, I'd go with a wide mouth because that's easier to use. And here is, uh, these are shots from a video that we have on our YouTube channel about making a sauerkraut. And I like to, especially when I'm experimenting things like with a, uh, a curry flavored sauerkraut recipe or kimchi or something like that, make small batches to test. So once you have your container, you're going to need some kind of weight. Because what you do is you reserve one of the cabbage leaves, let's just stick with the sauerkraut idea, uh, and set it aside, then you shred the cabbage, you sprinkle with salt, and you massage it like uh, squeezing it or even pounding it with, the, uh, with this pounder here to break up the edges. My apologies. Okay, uh, sorry about that, my apologies. Anyway, you let it sit and then you take the liquid, which is the salt is immediately gonna start pulling the liquid out of it. And you pack it firmly into the jar, which is the other reason or other good use for these pounders. And then you come put the lettuce leaf back on top and you place some kind of a weight and an, a, an airlock on top of it. And that brings us to airlocks. There's a lot of different kinds. These are ones that are specific, you can get through Amazon, that are specifically uh, for pickling. They even have a little dial on top that you can set the date that you started it fermenting. And then these are little uh, silicone uh, things that have just a little pinprick in the end there to let the, all of these let the fermenting gas escape but no bacteria and other air get in. And the nice thing about these is you can use a small jar or you can use a quart jar. 
uh, and they're relatively inexpensive. And if you also happen to do any fermenting for wine or things like that, you are probably familiar with one of these airlocks and you can get these little kind of gaskets and just make a hole in one of the uh, ball type plastic lids and put the gasket in and put that in and make your own airlock. And then this one is a combination of the weight and kind of an airlock is it fits fairly tight in here and it's filled with uh, water or brine and it makes its own water airlock here. All of these things we go into a lot more detail on the other video I mentioned. And this is an example of how it looks during the processing. You notice it's become kind of milky. And because I was moving this around a lot uh, to set it up for filming, it um, you could have seen a bunch of bubbles and things happening, but you can just barely see those there. They all got kind of dispersed. And then here are just some examples of the different kinds of uh, things that you can ferment. Uh, I This is my next project, the Moroccan spiced carrots. Uh, looking forward to that. I wasn't so hot on the fermented cranberries and I really wanna make this one, but it requires, if you wanna do it right, you're gonna do the whole toasting of the Indian spices and all of that and get some good organic limes to ferment. And then here are ways to contact us and also a lot of information about uh, on our YouTube channel. Our Facebook is where we first post notification about our uh, upcoming workshops, including things like these online workshops. But all of that is also on our blog page, which serves right now for our website. And this is a direct email to Center for Food Preservation Arts, and this is my phone number. Um, now down here is a link which uh, you can copy or, or type in that will take you to the resource list uh, that's also going to be mailed out to you as an attendee. And then this is the information about things that are going on at the Enviro House. Uh, would you like to talk about that, any um, adds to it? A couple comments that we are, I can get my picture up here. We are open now to the public um, four days a week, Thursday through Sunday from 11 to five. And um, I am putting that information in. I'm trying to keep track of what I have given you of what I haven't yet. So I'm putting my contact information and I will put those hours. I did note um, just prior to this, um, the YouTube link um, for seeing the recorded video as soon as our media department can get to getting this uploaded and on the city's YouTube channel, um, you can um, download or at least watch the uh, YouTube and see this all over again. And as Hal mentioned, I will, when we're finished with this, I will email um, the list of resources in the links um, on these pages. And then there's some additional ones that Hal has included that I will email out to each of you individually. Um, so hopefully that will answer that. If you have questions for the EnviroHouse, I'm also working Wednesdays from home. Um, feel free to contact me. This is our last webinar for this month, and we will be starting again in September. Those are not online yet, but they will be. Um, and we're also updating um, the EnviroHouse website. So there will soon be a lot more information available on the website. Um, and I have all of Hal's information in there and his website and his contact. I did not put the phone number in, I don't think, but um, everything else is in there. So I think that's all I have to add right now. Um, oh, well, just kind of, I always like to uh, put up a couple of jokes and I was really 
disappointed of the, um, there isn't that much uh, cucumber and pickle humor in a visual form out there right now. But at this point, I'd like to open it up for any questions, including things that are not on this topic. Well, this is your time to either type those in the chat. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can try uh, raising your hand and I'll see if I can unmute you. Um, if you don't have any questions, then um, we will close our webinar so that we don't have to do any editing at the end. And um, Hal, I'll touch base with you afterwards. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to leave this for a minute while we're saying goodbye here so you can go into the chat. If you do a control all, you can copy everything. Um, put it in a Word doc, an email, a notepad, whatever you have open on your computer. Um, and um, if you don't want to do that, then you will get it all in uh, email. So thanks again. And uh, hell, I'll see you in a few minutes. All righty. Thank you. All right. We're in this. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>